In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Follow with us today in the book of Exodus, chapter number 6. If you don't have your Bible, they'll have it posted on the overhead here where you can see it. <clears throat> and so you'll be able to read along with us a portion of Scripture from Exodus, chapter number 1. And verse, Exodus chapter number 6 and verse number 1. I'll have you confused before I ever get started. Exodus 6 and chapter, Exodus chapter 6, verse number 1. Then the Lord, everybody say, then the Lord said. Then the Lord said said unto Moses, now shalt thou see what I will. Somebody say, I will. What I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am. Everybody say, I am. I am am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am, but say I am, I am the Lord. And I will, somebody say, I will, bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will, somebody say, I will, rid you out of their bondage, and ah, you're catching on. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I, I am the Lord your God which bring you out of out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and I will give it you for a heritage. I am the Lord. Amen. I want to preach a few minutes here today on this thought when the I am says, I will. Hallelujah. When the I am says, I will. Let's give God some praise right now with our hands. Everybody, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, let's make some noise in the house for the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. And everybody shout amen. Amen. You can be seated if you're going to help me this morning preach. I don't want to work by myself. I like for folks to work with me. Amen. Elder Bass, years ago, when he was traveling in evangelistic work, pulling a travel trailer, pulled up to a church one day, and and, uh, and he said he was out there unhooking the trailer and getting it all set up, and a fellow from the church with a great desire to help him came out and uh, said, let me help you, Elder. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, he said, this is like the pulpit. It's a one-man job. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, that's how he felt about the pulpit. Well, I do believe that it needs to be one voice, but I can tell you this. It sure helps to have some help when it comes to the preaching of the Word of God. If you love it, say amen. If you believe it, say amen. Thank God. So many times folks say, well, why do you go back to the Old Testament and read from out of the Old Testament to preach and teach? Well, it's very simple. Uh, It's because that when we go to the Old Testament and we read the various stories that 
concern many different people in the Old Testament. A lot of time we see ourselves. And uh, we're able to identify with many things that we find written in the Old Testament. But we also, in seeing ourselves, we see God. And we see the works of God. And how that He helped people in their various circumstances of life. I believe that uh, where we are today, where the church is concerned, that uh, what you are in this house concerning the church, where you see people worshiping, people being baptized in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Ghost, I am confident that this is what the Lord has worked toward all these centuries. Amen. The church is His ultimate prize. The church is the ultimate reality of everything that God has ever worked for in the world. Someone said it rightfully so, that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so they work together. Sometimes we read the Old Testament and there might be some uh, questions there in our minds about the Old Testament and what does it really mean. Well, a lot of times the things that you read there, they may have a concealing factor involved. You may not know the reality of them until you get in the New Testament. And when you get in the New Testament, then it starts revealing what is concealed in the Old Testament. That's why in Luke chapter 24, uh, Jesus, when he was on the road to Emmaus, he spoke with those two men. And they, uh, as they were on their way from Jerusalem down to the uh, village, the town of Emmaus, uh, he asked them why that they were of such uh, sorrowful heart, and that their faces obviously carried the appearance of sadness and worry. And uh, they said, Did you, you've been, what's going on? You haven't been around? Don't you know what's been happening? This Jesus that... We had so much confidence in he's been crucified, and now we don't even know where he's at. Uh, everything's in an uproar, and we don't know where to from here. And Jesus said this, O oh, fools and slow of heart. Uh, he said to believe the, the law and the prophets, the, the words of the Old Testament, in other words. And it said that Jesus began at the law, at Moses and the prophets, and began to explain to them, help them understand everything in the Old Testament concerning himself. Now, Now, would not that have been a wonderful message to have heard that day? To have stood and listened to Jesus reveal to them everything that the Old Testament had to say about Him. Amen. That would have had, that would have been a revelation. That would have been a revelatory message to have heard what Jesus spoke about that day. Well, we weren't there and we didn't hear it, but thanks be to God, we have the New Testament in our possession today that gives us that same revelation that those men got on the road to Emmaus. Thank God for that. Amen. And so when we read about the people of Israel in the Old Testament, we realize when we get in the New Testament that they actually serve as a type of the church. They represent the church in the Old Testament, where we call typology, uh, that, that they are a type, they are a shadow of the church that is to come. Hebrews 8 and 5 tells us, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. And then Hebrews 10 and 1, he said, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. So what he's giving us an understanding in Hebrews is that out of the Old Testament we have examples, and we have shadows of heavenly things. And the law was a shadow of good things to come. And so when you read the Old Testament, we see how God works in the shadow, but we're able now to understand how he works in the real. We are not the shadow today. We are not a type. Amen. We are the reality of everything that he was doing in the Old Testament. He designed the people of Israel to be a people called by his name, and yet they were never baptized in his name, and they were never filled with his spirit. They had his spirit present with them, and there was a type of baptism when they come through the 
Red Sea and through the act of circumcision, but they didn't have the real experience that you and I have today. Thank God that we can repent of our sins and we can go down in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and having our sins washed away and we can be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. What a wonderful and glorious experience that we can have. Somebody praise Him right now. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, when I go back and I read about these various things that God did in the Old Testament and the things that He said, I get extremely excited because I understand when I read where God in the Old Testament said, I am. And then when he goes on to say, I will, I put those two things together and I realize that the God of the Old Testament being the God also the New Testament, that when he makes a promise, my friend, he can fulfill that promise. He can do exactly what he said he was going to do. And there's a reason why when God says, I will, you can believe that God will do it because he is the I am. And when you understand what he means by the I am, then you don't have a problem with the I will. I'm going to tell you today that God has made some promises in his word, and he's declared some I wills that you and I need to take confidence in and faith, because this God's got the power to do everything he said that he would do. Praise God. Praise God. I go to the Old Testament, and I look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And he said to Abraham, I'm going to make a promise to you. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses you, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. God made a threefold promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And so God gave him a threefold promise, and then ultimately said that in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, I'm sure that there probably were those that may have known about that promise that had great questions in their mind. But Abraham never had a question in his mind about the greatness of God. Because the Lord had said in Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 7, He said unto Abram, I am the Lord. Hallelujah. I am the Lord. Now that may not mean much to you until you understand what the word Lord actually means. It means the self Existent, eternal one. It means a God that exists all by himself. He does not need any external help. He doesn't need any external assistance in order for him to survive. He is the omnipresent God. He is the omniscient God, knowing all things. He is the omnipotent God who has all power in heaven above and the earth beneath. When God said, I am the Lord, He was saying to Abram, I'm the one that exists all by myself. I don't need a man to help me to live. I don't need a world to help me to survive. I don't need the assistance. I'm God. Hallelujah. I don't know how excited you get about your God, but I get excited about my God when I begin to realize how great He really is. Oh, glory to God. When He said, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, the first, the last, that means that God 
was the beginning. And God is going to be the ending. And it's going to be everything in between those two points. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has God in the beginning. He's the one that started all things. And He'll be God when it's all over with. And He doesn't need me today to live, to survive, to exist. And neither does He need you. But I can tell you, we need Him. I need Him every day that I live. I need Him every step that I take. I I need Him every decision I make. I need Him when I worship. I need Him when I'm praying. I need Him when I'm preaching. I need Him when I'm living and breathing. I need God. I need Him when I wake up in the morning time. I need Him when I go to bed at night. I need Him no matter what I'm doing. I need the help of God. Amen. So he says, I am the Lord. Somebody say the Lord. I'm the self-existent, eternal one. That means I have no beginning and no ending. You said, but you just said he was the beginning. That's because he's the one that started everything. And he is the ending because he'll be the one that ends everything. Hallelujah. And the reason why he is the beginning is because he was before the beginning. And he will be the ending because he will be after the ending. He is eternal. Oh, hallelujah. He is not governed by time. He is not governed by physical powers or mights. He is not governed by the sun, the moon, the stars. He is not governed by the seasons of fall, winter, and spring and summer. He's not governed by our attitudes or our spirits. He is not governed by our ups and our downs. Our God is eternal. Our God was here before there was a world. And when there is no more world, our God will still be here. You say, why are you saying this? I want you to understand when he says, I am, that means right now, here and now. Not just yesterday, not just tomorrow, but right now. He said before there was a world, I am. And when he created the world, he said, I am. When he stood on this earth and said before Abraham was, I am. He was saying, I exist. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. And in Genesis 17 and 1, <laughs> you, have, you can be bored today and do whatever you want to do, but I'm getting excited about this God I talk about. Genesis 17 and 1, he said, When Abram was 90 years old, and then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. I am the Almighty God. When he said the Almighty God, he was telling Abraham, I have and I possess all of the power. I've got all of the power. Nobody else has any power. I'm the only one that has the power. I'm the almighty God. I, oh, hallelujah. Nobody's got power beside me. Someone said, but you, you got me confused now, because when you get to Genesis chapter number, or I'm sorry, get to Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, chapter number 28, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And someone said, but I don't understand. How can God in the Old Testament say I'm the Almighty God? And Jesus of the New Testament can say uh, that I have and I possess all the power. That all power is given to me in heaven above uh, and the earth beneath. It's a simple, uh, a very simple explanation. uh, That God of the Old Testament, that God who said, uh, I am the Lord. That God who said, I am uh, the Almighty God. What He did where Jesus Christ was concerned was to put on him the form of flesh. He put on himself the robe of a man. Same God, same almighty, the same power, the same eternal one. Not a second one. Oh, hallelujah. That has now superseded the first one. Oh, come on now. Because this Jesus is a separate God than Jehovah God of the Old Testament, then that means that God has ceased to be God. And that 
Jesus uh, has now become God. But there's another problem with that. The Lord said, I am the Lord, which means the self-existent eternal one. Nobody can make themselves God. It's impossible to make yourself a self-existent eternal one. Come on now. Jesus did not become God, but God became man and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Woo! Come on now. Man can never be God, but God could be a man because He's all powerful. Woo! Amen. You can't make yourself God. Jesus could not make himself God. He had to be all man and all God. Jesus was God incarnate. It was God revealing himself in the flesh. That's what Jesus was. It was God who became man. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Somebody say amen. Amen. And verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. (laughs) Woo! Hallelujah! The Word. In the beginning was the Word. And that word, Word, there is more than just what is spoken. It's what is thought before it is spoken. So in the beginning was the thought. Hallelujah! In the beginning. That's what that word, Word, there means. When you study it, it's, it's, it's very root. It goes all the way back to not just the Word that's spoken, but the thought that is in the mind of the one that is speaking the Word. And so in the beginning was the thought. Amen. And the thought was the thinker who thought the thought. Woo! Hallelujah! I said the thought was the thinker who thought the thought because you can't separate the thinker from the thought. Oh, hallelujah! I said you can't separate the thinker. If you're thinking something in your mind, it's your thoughts. It's your thoughts. And you can't separate your thoughts from you. In the beginning was the thought and the thinker. And the thought was the thinker who thought the thought. Hallelujah. Amen. And the thought was the thinker. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the thought. And the Word was with God. And the thought was with the thinker who thought the thought. And the Word was God. And the thought was God. Hallelujah. And then verse 14, and the thought was made flesh. What was the thought? I'll tell you what the thought was. God looks down and sees them. Amen. His great creation or his in His mind, His plan. He's got a master plan already established for all eternity. For all the world. He's already got a plan in mind. He's going to create a world. He's going to put some things there that that world can sustain itself. Amen. By continual seasons, day in and day out, week after week, month after month. And I'm going to put me a man there. I'm going to make him higher than all the other creation that I make. And whenever I make that man, I'm going to give him something that nobody else in the creation has. I'm going to give him the ability to reason and make a choice. And the choice he's going to have is to live from me or to live according to his own flesh. Hallelujah. And God looked down and said, I know what's going to happen when I give him that choice. That man's going to fail. Don't tell me that God, who is omniscient, who knows all things from the beginning to the ending, he knows everything, the ending from the beginning, that God that knew it all knew that there was going to be a transgression of God's Word. And that man would backslide. 
And God said, what will I do? How will I save him? Because when he sins, the only thing that will satisfy the judgment of sin is death. That's the only sentence. That's the only thing that will satisfy the judgment of sin. In the day that you sin, you'll surely die. And so the only thing that can bring about judgment is going to be death. But there, there can't just be death. There's got to be a resurrection. There's got to be a bringing into a new life. I've got to bring this man from where he was to where I want him to be. And God has said, what am I going to do? He looked down at the turtle doves and said, that's not enough. He looked at the blood of bulls and goats and said, that won't be enough. But I'll tell you what I will do. The thought of God and His master plan was this. I Hallelujah. The creator of the man who made him in the beginning. I will come down in that same flesh. And I will robe myself in flesh. And I will die on a cross. But I won't die just to be buried. But I will die to resurrect and to come out of the grave. To give that man a chance to be saved and not be lost for eternity. Come on now. Come on now. Come on. Hey, I'm trying to get when the I am says I will, but I'm getting I'm having a hard time getting off the I am part right now. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so God said, this is what I'm going to do. I'll come down. I'm going to make myself a body. And so whenever he made Adam in the beginning, uh come on now, when he made Adam in the beginning, uh, he made him uh, like he was going to come uh, 4,000 years later. Hallelujah. God said, what kind of body am I going to make this man? I'm going to make him in the kind of body I'm going to have. Because when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, it was Paul that said, uh, the first man, Adam, was of the earth. But the second man, Adam, was the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ uh, was the second man, Adam. But he wasn't just saying the ace. He wasn't just any old Adam. He wasn't from the same lineage uh, of all the other Adams. He was God. Because Matthew 1 the angel said to Joseph, Fear not to take Mary your wife, to be your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Come on now, hang with me just a few more minutes. I'm going to get to the I will here just a second, I think. Amen. He said, That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And so listen, if you contend that there are set three separate distinct persons in the Godhead, and that Jesus is one, and that the Father is another, and the Holy Ghost is another, then we have a major problem here. Because Matthew 1 said that the Holy Ghost was what conceived Jesus Christ in the womb. Amen. In other words, the Holy Ghost was the Father. Amen. The Holy Ghost was the Father, but Jesus talked about the Father. What is the distinct difference here? The difference is, first of all, when you understand that Jesus as man referred to the Spirit as Father because the Spirit was the Father of His flesh. It was what conceived in Mary and that child was born. I don't want to confuse your mind today and I don't think I will if I just say you simply this that when you talk about Father and you talk about Son and you talk about Holy Ghost you're merely talking about three different offices that one Spirit has manifested Himself in uh, to perform certain works here on earth. Uh, God Almighty became the Father of creation. Uh, and then that same Spirit said, I'm going to put myself a body on. Uh, I'm going to cause a young lady uh, to conceive by my Spirit. Uh, it won't be by the natural, normal human methods. Uh, it's going to be by my Spirit because uh, that one that's going to be born, uh, his blood cannot be tainted uh, by the blood of that. Adam number one. But it's got to be blood that is given by the Spirit. So that that blood, whenever it's shed on Calvary, can cleanse men from their sins. Huh? And so I'll be called the Son. 
because I'll have a body. But that body was taken out of the earth. And the reason is because there had to be another office fulfilled. The office of the Holy Ghost living inside of us. Because Jesus said in John 14, John 15, John 16, He said the Holy Ghost. He said now, He's the Comforter. And said, you know who He is because He's with you now. But He shall be in you. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And so Jesus is telling those disciples that I've got to go away. Because if I don't go away, the Comforter can't come. Now you know who He is, so don't get worried about whether or not it's some Somebody you're not familiar with. You're familiar with him because you've been walking with him for three and a half years now. Hallelujah. You've been there. You've been by him when he healed the blinded eyes. When he unstopped the deaf ears. When he raised the dead. You've been with him when he fed the five thousand. Amen. With five loaves and two fishes. Beside women and children there were five thousand men. You were there. You were beside me. I was walking with you, but the day is coming. Uh, we don't. Well, we won't just walk together. We won't just be in the flesh together. But I'm going to be in you. My spirit is going to abide within you. And the only way is if I go away. And I got to go away in order for my spirit to come back and in, live inside of you. So, Father, is a title describing His creative powers in the world. Him fathering, progenitoring. He is the progenitor of all things. Being the Son, it describes not another deity, not a second person, not a place in the Godhead, but it describes redemption and our salvation. Hallelujah. And Holy Ghost describes that experience that indwells us, that empowers us to become the sons of God, that empowers us to live for God in this present world. You can't live this by yourself, friend. You got to have the Holy Ghost. You got to have the power of resurrection. You got to have that power that gives you brand new life. Amen. And so, when you talk about I will, somebody say I will. You see, we can have confidence in the I wills of God if we believe in the I am. If we believe in what he says about I am. When he says, I am the Almighty God. When he says, I am the Lord. And we understand who he is. Then we can recognize that that God is able. Amen. Now, God was talking to Abraham. And and in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer explains it this way. He said, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply, and I will multiply you. And so that after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. And so what this writer is explaining is this, that when God made an oath, when he made a covenant with Abraham. You see, back in those times uh, when there was a covenant made between uh, two people or two nations, uh, then uh, they would always swear by something uh, greater than themselves. For instance, they may have been standing at the foot of a high mountain and, and they would swear by this mountain. They would say, as sure as this mountain stands, uh, then this oath that we have made between one another is going to be confirmed and solidified, and you have no worry about me backing up on my oath. And so God is there talking to Abraham, and he's getting ready to make an oath. He's getting ready to say, Abraham, I want to tell you now, I'm getting ready to make you some promises. And he said, just as sure as. And God looked at the mountain and said, that ain't greater than me because I made that mountain. He looked at the sun and he said, that's not greater than me because I made that sun. He looked at the stars and the moon and said, Oh, I 
I can't swear by them because I made all of them. God had to finally say, Abraham, as sure as I am. Hallelujah. As sure as I am God. As sure as I live. As sure as I exist. You can believe in what I'm about to tell you. You can, my God, you hear me today, church? Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you today why my confidence is in God. He's never let me down. He's never failed me. He's never disappointed me. My God has always been there. Now, let me tell you something. Your, uh, your, your doctor might promise you something he can't fulfill. Because he has limitations. He has limitations on, number one, his abilities. He has limitations, number two, on his education. What he knows, what he's learned, right? He may even have limitations where time is concerned. Because you may go to the doctor today and he'll make some promises about what he's going to do for you. And you go back 30 days later and the doors are locked and they tell you we shut the practice down because the doctor died. Huh? So he might be limited by time. You may, as a matter of fact, I'll pick on somebody all y'all know about around here. Your pest control specialist, your technician, <laughs> they, might, they might make promises to you they can't fulfill. Is that right, Sister Tender? Amen. Help me out. Keep preaching with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I'm just what I'm pointing out is men are limited. They can only do so much. That's why when we preach around here about the greatness of God and what God is able to do, we can say, thank God for everything out there that everyone's trying to do to help mankind with, whether it be chemical dependency, whether it be alcoholism, whether it be drug addiction, or whatever the case might be. All of those things are noble efforts on the part of other humans to help their, their fellow companions in this world. But i got to tell you, there's a limitation. AA can only do so much. Your doctor can only do so much. Your lawyer is limited. I'm preaching about the I am today who says I've got all power. I am omniscient. I know everything about you. I am on my presence. I'm everywhere at all times. I'm omnipotent. I've got all the power. Whatever you need, I've got your answer. When the I am says, I will, you can get ready, friend. He knows how to do it. He's not just slapping his gums together. He's not just playing footsies under the table with you. He's not just trying, amen, to somehow, uh, you know, just play games with your mind. When the I am, who's got all power, what I'm preaching here today is the God that we're preaching about in this pulpit. I don't really care that there are people in our world today that says there is no God. The Word of God says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's what the fool says. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, friend, you hear me and you hear me clearly that the God we serve has got all power. He can do whatever you have need of. Somebody say amen. And so, God, when he swore, he didn't just look around and said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. He swore by himself. As sure as I live. As sure as I'm God. As long as I exist. Abraham, this covenant is going to be valid. And it's going to be kept. Can I tell you today that the covenant God made with Abraham almost 6,000, 5,000 years ago, how many, how many hundreds or thousands of years ago it was, it's still in effect today. But he's a God that keeps covenant. <laughs> Somebody said, I'm worried about Israel. Don't worry about Israel. God's going to take care of her. Just like God's going to take care of his church. Can I get a witness? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, whenever... Whenever you stop to realize, and I, I think that probably I'm not going to get finished with this today. And so I'm not going to try to finish it. We'll just draw a line and come back next Sunday. 
Does that sound all right? Amen. You see, when the I am says, I will, you don't have anything to worry about. Because this I am made the world. Huh? Somebody told me here recently, they actually sent me this, sent me an email, and said God and was listening to some scientists who were bragging that they could make man. They were going to make a man. He said, all right. He said, come on up. We'll, we'll see about that. And so God said, now look, when I made the first man, I made him out of dirt. Made him out of dust. Made him out of the clay of the earth. And they said, ain't no problem, God. We can do the same thing. So they ran out and started getting their hands in the dirt. And God said, what? Hang on just a second. That's my dirt. Go make your own dirt. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're about to use what I made. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some folks like, some folks like that uh, class had that teacher that, uh, was trying to explain to them about blood and the flow of blood and how that, that the teacher said, Said to her students, she says, now if I were to stand on my head, all of my blood would go to my head. My face would get real red and purple because the blood would flow down to my head. Said, isn't that something? Said, you know, y'all, y'all, oh yeah, we all agree. We've done that before. We got our face red because all the blood went down. And she said, now can the, can the class tell me, anybody, why it is that when I'm standing up, all the blood don't go to my feet? One student piped up in the back and said, Teacher, it's because your feet aren't empty. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody shout, Praise the Lord. Amen. You, you say, Why are you telling these things to wrap it up? Because sometimes people can identify with certain things. You may not understand everything I've said this morning, but i I tell you another little story here. about in, in, a, in a college classroom, a professor was up, and he was going to prove to the whole class that there was no God. And so he said, I want to ask a question. Has anybody seen God? Nobody raised their hand. No, we've never seen God. Has anybody heard the voice of God? Nobody heard the voice of God. Has anybody felt God? Has anybody touched the physical God? Nobody raised their hand. Everybody, no, we've never touched. He said, well, he said, if you've never seen him, if you've never touched him, if you've never heard his voice, then apparently there is no God. And the class got real quiet. And the student in the back said, may I ask a couple of questions? Sure, go right ahead. He said, class, I want to ask you all a question. Has anybody seen the professor's brain? No. Has anybody felt the professor's brain? No. Has anybody heard the professor's brain speak? No. We never heard it. He said, but then using the same logic that the professor used about God, I think all of us could come to the final conclusion our professor doesn't have a brain. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Come on, somebody shout praise the Lord. Amen. What I'm trying to preach to you here today is there is an I am. There is a God. And that God is still God. And He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no variableness in Him. And when that God says, I will, you can count on Him because He's got the power to do it. Nobody else can do fully and completely sometime everything they promise. But there's a God in heaven who's got all the power and He can do whatever He has promised. I don't have time today because obviously... If I got in the next section, we've already been preaching 45 minutes for the clock watchers. Amen. But if I were to get started in the next section, we'd be here at least 45 more minutes or longer. Who knows? Y'all may never get lunch this afternoon. Someone said, watch me. (laughs) I will. (laughs) Amen. But you see, you've got to understand something. That 
when we talk about God and the greatness of God, you might look at your situations and think, mm, that's too big. And God says, I will. Nobody else can handle this. And God says, I will. My life is so messed up. I don't know which way to turn. I don't know how to figure it out. And God says, I will. Huh? You may look at your life and say, you know what? If I could just be born all over again. If I could just start life all over again. If I could get it brand new. If somehow... I could get some help to do that. If I could just go back and start it. If I could go back and start life with the knowledge I have of life right now. If somebody could just help me. I wonder. God says, I will. I will. Because I knew you before you were born. And I've seen every step you took, and I know every mistake you've made and every sin that you've committed. That's why I'm big enough that if you'll just repent of your sins, if you'll just say, God, I'm sorry. Huh? Does anybody hear me? God, I'm sorry. And we just repent. He says, I'll forgive you of everything from this point back. Every mistake you ever made, even whenever you were six years old and you lied about not getting that candy that they said you got. I'll forgive you of that. I'll forgive you of everything you've ever done. And then if you'll just go down in water and be baptized. Someone said, you know, if I could just get cleansed, if somebody could just cleanse me, if somebody would just wash me clean, get all this junk off of me. God says, I will. If you'll just go down in water, in baptism, in my name, in the name of Jesus, I'll wash all your sins away. (laughs) Huh? I'll wash them all away. Let me tell you something. Why do I serve God? Because He's the I Am. He is the I Am. That means He's been with me all that time, but He's right now here today with me. Why am I going to serve him tomorrow? Because he's I am tomorrow. He's, he's what I need. I challenge you here that are in this house this morning to understand that God is all powerful. And it does not matter what state of life you're in. Jesus can say to you, I will. I read to you this morning from the book of Exodus where God told Moses, Go tell the people of Israel, I will. And what God said was, there's, there's seven things He says, I will to. And I'm not going to get into them. I, may, I might come back and preach some more of this next week. Seven things He said, I will do. And if you'll notice, at, before He started saying, I will, and after He said, I will, He said, I am. And the reason why he prefaced it and he put a tag on the end of it and said, I am the Lord, was because he wanted them to know whatever I'm about to promise and what I have promised, i got the power to do it. I am the Lord. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what state of life you are in. I don't know what your troubles are. I don't know what kind of decisions you're having to make. I don't know where your life is. But Jesus knows where it's at. I'm just a man this morning. I'm finite. I have my limitations. I can only do so much. But I serve a God who can do all things. And when he says, I am, that means he can do it right now. When he told Martha when her brother died and he says, I am the resurrection, He was not saying sometime in the future will I do it. He says, I'm resurrection power right now. I can do the work that needs to be done right now. Why do I preach this way? Because I want you to know, friend, that in Jesus Christ, there's a life of I will and not I can't. Huh? There's a life of I will and not I can't. When you talk to him and you ask him for certain things, he says, I will. Because he's the God that's got the power to do it. 
Let's stand this morning. There's a holy touch of God. And I know this service is not over with. Please don't leave. But we want to we want to open this altar and give somebody a chance to talk to Jesus this morning. We want to give somebody an opportunity to call upon. I'm wishing I could see the finish line Where it ends, where it lands Guess I lost my vision when the pain set in Can I believe when I don't see Can I really let it be out of my hands when it's out of my hands this is a word i choose but it's where i'm finding you but i'm broken and undone your mercy's just begun you overcome my doubt your hands are reaching out you hold me through the storm and i will fear no
Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 